In chapter 14 of the book of Isaiah, we read of the account of the fall of Lucifer. With the enlightened understanding of Enoch, we derive something more from these passages than we have ever derived before. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee, and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness? and destroyed the cities thereof that opened not the house of his prisoners. All the kings of the nations, even all of them, lie in glory, every one in his own house. But thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch, and as the raiment of those that are slain, thrust through with a sword that go down to the stones of the pit, as a carcass trodden under feet. Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial, because thou hast destroyed thy land and slain thy people. The seed of evildoers shall never be renowned. Prepare slaughter for his children for the iniquity of their fathers, that they do not rise nor possess the land nor fill the face of the world with cities. For I will rise up against them, saith the Lord of hosts, and cut off from Babylon the name and, rem and remnant, and son and nephew, saith the Lord. I will also make it a possession for the bittern, and pools of water, and I will sweep it with the besom of destruction, saith the Lord of hosts. The Lord swears his purpose against this particular individual, for all the evil works he has committed on earth. And none shall disannul it or turn it back. The hand of the Lord is stretched out in the judgment of this individual who is likened unto the morning star, the brightness of Venus. The entire chapter 14 of Isaiah concerns itself with this individual. Isaiah looks to a future time and gives the Lord's comfort to Israel that they will know surcease from the oppressor. And in that time, the pomp of this fallen one will be brought down, and they will point to the fallen one as becoming weak as men, weak as we are. Our hypothesis is that this was Isaiah's prophecy of the incarnation of the one called Lucifer as a king of Babylon who would work so much destruction, even of his own people, and of the punishment that was to be upon him. Isaiah was prophesying of a future event of this fallen one and beyond that event of the relief of the people in a future age. The entire passage then remaining describes the final destruction of this king of Babylon, who shall be cast out of his grave like an abominable branch. So heinous are his crimes. The Hebrew title of Lucifer is Halel ben Shahar, which means day star, son of the morning. It is a name that could be a name of an ordinary man, a descriptive name, which we have so much of in Hebrew tradition, who had the attributes of the fallen archangel.
In consideration, then, that Lucifer might have had one or more physical incarnations, we should also observe that the spirit of Lucifer is an all-pervading spirit, which has been known to affect entire cultures and civilizations. Even when it was focused through the incarnation of himself or the individual who might have been his physical counterpart when he was out of the body. So that it could well be just to say that whether or not that king was an incarnation of Lucifer, that he was the focus and the fulcrum of the Luciferian consciousness to an age and through a kingdom and an entire population. Now you understand the principle of the three kingdoms of God, of the Elohim who embody the power of the Lord to create through elementals, through nature. And by the spoken word, they bring forth the words. You understand the sons of God who embody his wisdom and authority and therefore are the rulers, for they have the crown. And finally, the angels embodying the third person of the Trinity as the love ray are intended to emit and pulsate through all kingdoms the beautiful feelings of God, even the desires of God to fulfill himself through his creation. Now the force of the fallen angels is so great that when a single fallen angel is in one city, it is almost unmistakable or unavoidable that everyone in that city partake of a portion of, even a grain of that fallen one's consciousness. Everyone is tinged by the soot upon the wings of the fallen ones. Because of the good angels and the bad angels severally occupying the large cities of the earth or any area, we note that there are distinct characteristics of peoples on the face of the earth. And these characteristics have to do with the actual hierarchy of fallen angels, as well as the hierarchies of the sons of God that are living in the geographical area. Sometimes the fact that peoples will excel in a talent, like the motion picture industry in Los Angeles, has to do not only with the chakra of the city, ours being the seat of the soul mirroring the souls of the earth, but with the, the fact that there is a great gathering of fallen angels in this area whose talents in the higher realms before their fall have been the dramatizations of the epics of Almighty God. Now the fact that angels, good and bad, have such an influence is because of their larger auras. For the power of God is in his desiring. As it is said, Jesus, joy of man's desiring, the joy of God's desiring. The desire body holds the matrix for the precipitation of creation. And the angels themselves are created to hold that force field on behalf of the sons of God and the Elohim. With that awareness, we can understand Origen's teachings that those individuals who are eminent in civilization, for good or for ill, are embodied angels. They have the greatest influence among peoples. Now Isaiah is talking about archetypically the fallen one Lucifer and the effects of his consciousness on an age, a civilization, and a people. He's talking about the one and the many fallen ones. I have for some time understood, as the masters have shown to me, that Lucifer in past ages was indeed embodied. And I trusted that sooner or later the confirmation of his embodiment would be forthcoming. This certainly, this text of Isaiah, is a step in that direction. It has never been interpreted as I have given it to you. So you may hold it there for further in-depth study, confirmation, or denial. 
Now the church fathers saw in the Isaiah verses the story of the fall of angels through pride rather than through lust, as in the Enoch tale. Some of the fathers believed that both sins, pride and lust, were present in the angels who fell, that the two sins were not mutually exclusive. But the latter fathers unanimously chose the story of the fall of the angels through pride and rejected the Enochian story of the fall through lust because it implied the controversial doctrine of the corporeality of the wicked angels and their bodily presence upon earth. With the Isaiah excuse, they could sweep out the door, the fall through lust. Now one called Julius Africanus was apparently the first Christian to challenge the traditional story of the fall of the angels through lust. He even tackled Genesis 6 verses 1 to 4 about the sons of God and the daughters of men, the single echo of the Enoch tale in approved scripture. The verse reads, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Genesis 6, 1 to 4 is a scriptural chapter and verse which you should memorize because it have, has been studied and restudied, theorized, delved into for centuries. Julius Africanus notes his opinion that the sons of God in Genesis 6, 2 who saw the daughters of men and took them wives didn't refer at all to angels but to the righteous sons of Seth who fell in the moral sense by taking wives of the inferior daughters of Cain, a legend fully explained in the apocryphal books of Adam and Eve. For Julianus, these sons of God were probably not angels, and the phrase in Genesis need not contain e any reference to the fall of angels through lust. The point we must make about Julius Africanus' interpretation concerning the sons of Seth versus the sons of God who saw the daughters of men, is that these sons of God, or the angels, who saw the daughters of men and took themselves wives, had incarnated. Some of them could have incarnated through Seth and therefore taken themselves wives of the inferior daughters of Cain. Or the sons of Seth could have been influenced by them. As you recall the story, Cain killed Abel. The unrighteous versus the righteous. The humanly good versus the humanly bad. But Abel was replaced by Seth. And Eve bare a son and called his name Seth, for God said, for God, said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. Now Seth had a son, Enos, and when Enos was born, it is written, then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord returns in the person of Seth. Seth I regard as a good angel, even an incarnation of Jesus Christ one of the legions of Sanat Kumara. Seth being an angel, his sons could have been angels. And some of these angels could have been converted by the prior of fallen angels to lust. According to Julius, the sons of God were probably not angels. The point is that they were angels, whether they came through Seth and were angels of light and subsequently fell by being tempted by the daughters of Cain, who were the seed of the fallen angel, Cain, or whether they fell directly from heaven 
and cohabitated with the daughters of Cain. Africanus' argument, therefore, collapses because in terms of the history of the earth, both events occurred. And there is abundant evidence for both arguments. Whether they were the seed of Seth or of the Watchers, they were in both instances angels who fell. The opinions of the Church Fathers soon flocked to the interpretation of Julius Africanus. The Syrian authority Ephraim also declared that Genesis 6 referred to the Sethites and the Cainites, and therefore not the fall of angels through lust. Hilary of Tours casually mentions the tale of the lustful fall of angels as if it were folly about which he says some book or other exists, but nothing we need not know, those things which are not contained in the book of the law. Syrian theologian Theodore, Theodoret simply called believers of the story in Enoch stupid and very silly. Now those comments persist to the present hour in many circles. Then Jerome, doctor of the church and scholarly Hebraist, got into the argument. Jerome definitely branded Enoch as apocryphal and compared its teachings on the incarnation of fallen angels to the Manichaean teachings, which Jerome emphatically denounced as heretical. These are Jerome's words. We have read in a certain apocryphal book that when the sons of God were coming down to the daughters of men, they descended upon Mount Hermon, and they are entered into an agreement to come to the daughters of men and make them their wives. This book is quite explicit and is classified as apocryphal. The ancient exegetes have at various times referred to it, but we are citing it not as authoritative, but merely to bring it to your attention. I have read about this apocryphal book in the work of a particular author who used it to confirm his own heresy. What does he say? He says the sons of God who came down from heaven upon Mount Hermon and coveted the daughters of men are angels descending from the heavens and souls that desired bodies, since bodies are the daughters of men. Do you detect the source of the teachings of Manichaeus the ignorant? Just as the Manichaeans say that souls desired human bodies to be united in pleasure, do not they who say that angels desired bodies are the daughters of men seem to you to be saying the same thing as the Manichaeans? It would take too long to refute them now, but I merely wanted to indicate the coincidence, as it were, of the book that opportunely confirmed their dogma. Note the sarcasm of Jerome in his statement that the Book of Enoch opportunely confirmed the dogma of Manichaeus the ignorant, as if to say that the author of Enoch was responsible for the supposed heresies of the Manichaeans. By implying that the teachings of the Book of Enoch were in cahoots with the Manichaean doctrines, Jerome castigated the book severely. Manichaeanism, a powerful competitor against the Church, was founded by a Persian visionary named Mani who claimed the apostleship under Jesus Christ, believed himself the promised paraclete, which means he believed himself to be an embodiment of the Holy Spirit, and he preached a synthesis of several major religions, Zoroastrianism, Buddhism, Hinduism, as well as Christ's teachings. Jerome and other church fathers fought fiercely against certain heresies of this popular eclectic religion, refuting Manichaeanism by every possible means. Jerome's statement that the Book of Enoch's doctrines opportunely supported Manichaeanism certainly would have cast aspersions upon the book's spiritual integrity. And not surprisingly, the core of Jerome's argument is against the Manichaean doctrine that souls desired human bodies to be united in pleasure, which Jerome more or less equates with the Enochian story of the fall of the angels through lust, a story Jerome certainly would reject. This individual, Jerome himself, is none other than one of these fallen angels, using his position 
cleverly obtained in the church to deny the pure teachings of Sanat Kumara, of Enoch, of the prophets, and of our Lord. Church Father Chrysostom took the case against Enoch one step further. Who were those sons of God in Genesis 6? Certainly not angels, says, says Chrysostom. He thinks that opinion absurd and refutes it with vigor. Would you like to hear his outraged words? Here is first the most audacious theory of which we are going to show you the absurdity by presenting to your meditation the true meaning of the scripture so that you do not allow your ear to be open to those who utter such blasphemy and who dare to speak against themselves. They say that it is not men that are referred to here but angels and that it is the angels that are called sons of God. It would be folly to accept such insane blasphemy saying that an incorporeal and spiritual nature could have united itself to human bodies. With Chrysostom, the problem presented by the Book of Enoch finally gets fully defined. It was not really just a question of whether angels fell through pride or through lust, but whether angels ever took on human bodies at all in their fall. Two Christian apologists in the centuries previous to Chrysostom had speculated in detail on that idea of the incarnation of the fallen angels in matter. Lactantius believed that the fall resulted in a degradation of the angelic nature itself, that the once heavenly angels, in fact, had become quite earthly. The earlier apologist, Tatian, went into greater detail regarding this degradation. He described how the angels became engrossed in material things and believed that their very nature became coarse, gross, and material. Catholic scholar Emil Schneeweiss describes Tatian's view that the fallen angels sank deeper and deeper into matter, becoming the slaves of concupiscence and lust. Some editors of Tatian's work warn the reader to beware of passages where Tatian seems rashly to imagine the demons to be material creatures. He says that the demons, having received their structure from matter and obtained the spirit which inheres in it, became intemperate and greedy. Some few indeed turning to what was purer, but others choosing what was inferior in matter and conforming their manner of life to it. Some note that Tatian did not think them material in the ordinary sense of the word, but it is clear from his own writings that he thought them no mere etheric intangible essences, but very physical and tangible beings. It was this issue, the descent of the angels into the physical world through lust, that so infuriated Chrysostom and caused him to issue his judgment of the insane blasphemy of Enoch's tale. Chrysostom's edict that angels were spiritual and men were physical and never the twain should meet found agreement with Caesarius of Arles, who also insisted that angels are incorporeal and therefore could not have mated with women. Philastrius in the late fourth century condemned the story in Enoch as actual heresy. In his long list of heresies of which Enoch's tale is heresy number 108, <laughs> Philastrius declares, there is no doubt that the angels who were cast down from heaven are not similar to human nature if only because to suggest such a thing would be blasphemy and contrary to the law. Moreover, if he who thought it to be correct that the angels so sinned, having been transformed into the flesh, so that he believes that they remained in this very flesh or thus did such carnal deeds, this one discerns history with a convoluted logic. And at the Second Council of Constantinople, if in 553 AD, the church specifically anathematized, which means that they officially cursed origin statements on the subject of spirits falling from a heavenly estate into gross bodies such as ours, and who would be called men. Three of the 15 anathemas against origin curse his teachings on the incarnation of fallen spirits 
and angels becoming men. Now these anathemas have stood to the present hour, so you can understand why Christians, both Catholic and Protestant, of an orthodox bent, would curse anyone who would carry on the tradition of Origen. The long proclamation repeating after each of Origen's ideals, if anyone shall say this, let him be anathema, let him be cursed, must have weighed heavily upon the conscience of the believer. Would anyone thereafter dare to believe that angels could incarnate? Now who roams the earth cursing the body of believers, the children of the light, for their beliefs? Who are these fallen ones in high places who actually curse the saints? Since when is a curse a part of the office of the priesthood of Melchizedek? Nevertheless, despite Philastria's proclamation of heresy and the official cursing of Origen's ideas, some questions remained. What about certain translations, like the Septuagint, certain translations of the Bible, known to the Church Fathers in which Genesis 6-4 actually read angels of God instead of sons of God? What about biblical references to the physical nature of angels, like the angel with whom Jacob wrestled, and the two angels whom Lot had to physically hide from the homosexuals who lusted to know the angels. The homosexuals of Sodom desired to have intercourse with the angels who visited Lot's house. And had not Jesus Christ accused the wicked, ye are of the Father, ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do, indicating that fallen angels, namely the devil, had lusts? Other scriptures recorded similar tales. Certainly, some Christians knew the story of Zarathustra, who dashed to pieces the bodies of the angels because they had made an evil use of them for wandering on the earth and especially for amatory dealings with earthly women. The story of fallen angels incarnating in earthly bodies is a difficult one to refute, unless, of course, you ignore the evidence. The Church Fathers couldn't see the fallen angels. They couldn't distinguish them as fallen angels because they themselves were fallen angels. <laughs> the persecutors of Mani and the Manichaeans and others like them who have kept the flame are persecuting the light bearers today and every body of believers from Enoch to Origen and on who believe these things were cursed and put down and murdered and destroyed in bloodshed by these fallen angels who were the spiritually wicked in high places. When you speak about spiritual wickedness in high places, spiritual wickedness has to refer to the wickedness of spiritual beings, and spiritual beings are angels. So we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers of the darkness of this world, of this physical plane, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And so Paul taught us, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Paul also spoke to the Colossians regarding the hierarchies of heaven in the same vein as Origen did. He spoke of the Son of God, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. The power of the creative word established orders and hierarchies of beings of different orders. This is another proof that the Apostle Paul knew that the warfare was not flesh and blood, 
and that the identity of the individual was not according to his flesh and blood, but according to his state of consciousness. Actually, the state where he stopped falling. Everybody fell a little bit. Origen described that fall in his works. And some spirits were compelled willingly or unwillingly to help others who fell. So Paul knew that the adversary was according to the degree or rank of his fall. And so he named those with whom we have the battle and the warfare the rulers of the darkness of this world, who had the attainment of principalities and powers. And instead of saying spiritual wickedness, it could be said the spiritually wicked who occupy the high places, the upper echelons of society that we categorize according to the upper chakras. The power position of the throat chakra, the authoritative word, the seat of government, the rulership of light in the heart, the third eye occupying money, commerce, and banking in its perversion, and finally in the, the place of the crown chakra with their, inter their intellectual knowledge and authority in every field. We can examine Paul's statements in the light of Origen's teaching that the spirits descended in various levels of descent and therefore various names by their descent. The later church council, the 553 AD, anathematized Origen's teachings on these hierarchies of heaven, both good and evil, by the following decrees. This is the word pronounced by the church against Origen. If anyone shall say that the creation of all reasonable things includes only intelligences without bodies and altogether immaterial, having neither number nor name, so that there is unity between them all by identity of substance, force, and energy, and by their union with and knowledge of God the Word, but that no longer desiring the sight of God, they gave themselves over to worse things, each one following his own inclinations, and that they have taken bodies more or less subtle and have received names, for among the heavenly powers there is a difference of names as there is also a difference of bodies. And thence some became and are called cherubims, others seraphims and principalities and powers and dominations, and thrones and angels, and as many other heavenly orders as there may be. Let him be anathema. If anyone shall say all of that teaching, let him be anathema. Let him be cursed. The church also directed two other anathemas against Origen. If anyone shall say that the reasonable creatures in whom the divine love had grown cold have been hidden in gross bodies such as ours and have been called men, while those who have attained the lowest degree of wickedness have shared cold and obscure bodies and are become and called demons and are become and called demons and evil spirits, let him be anathema. If anyone shall say that a psychic condition has come from an angelic or archangelic state, and moreover that a demoniac and a human condition has come from a psychic condition, that is, from the condition of the soul, and that from a human state they may become again angels and demons, and that each order of heavenly virtues is either all from those below or from those above or from those above and below, let him be anathema. So now you know what the church thinks about these teachings. But the issue was settled once and for all with the logical and technical arguments of Augustine, who rejected the tale of the fall of angels through a physical lust and mating with women as implying an impossibility for angelic natures. Now this inability to accept the fall of angels goes back to the fact that angels were beings created to amplify the light of their leader, who should amplify the light of the Son of God. They were not given free will in the sense that the sons of God were given free will. 
They were created to be electrodes of the desire body of God, to emanate feelings, to infuse the whole matter cosmos with the feelings of God. The angels who were cast out of heaven with Lucifer, as recorded in chapter 12 of the book of Revelation, simply followed their leader blindly. They thought him to be so great. They followed him as some leader of a great cosmic breakthrough. Now you can see in some of these church fathers who were embodied fallen angels that they never wanted to admit that they lost their state of holy innocence. They could not believe, they would not allow themselves to believe that there was such a thing as the lost innocence. They still were the champions of the decision of their leader and they sought to reinterpret the teachings of Jesus Christ to fit the teachings of the fallen archangel. Some of the most notable and respected of the writers of the church, the early church, have completely twisted and turned around the divine doctrine by way of defending psychologically their own lowly estate. Now this is what Augustine declares we made a passing reference to this question, but did not decide whether angels, inasmuch as they are spirits, could have bodily intercourse with women. For it is written, who maketh his angels spirits. That is, he makes those who are by nature spirits his angels by appointing them to the duty of bearing his messages. However, the same trustworthy scripture testifies that angels have appeared to men in such bodies as could not only be seen, but also touched. There is, too, a very general rumor which many have verified by their own experience or which trustworthy persons, persons who have heard the experience of others corroborate that sylvans and fawns, who are commonly called incubi, had often made wicked assaults upon women and satisfied their lust upon them, and that certain devils are constantly attempting and affecting this impurity is so generally affirmed that it were impudent to deny it. From these assertions, indeed, I dare not determine whether there be some spirits embodied in an aerial substance and who are capable of lust and of mingling sensibly with women. But certainly, I could by no means believe that God's holy angels could at that time have so fallen. He could not believe it because to so believe would spell his own personal judgment. At subconscious levels, they all knew better. That is why they all protested so much. They protested too much, and they revealed who they were. Augustine continues with a long proof that the phrase sons of God in Genesis 6 refers to the righteous sons of Seth who married the daughters of Cain. He concludes, let us omit then the fables of those scriptures which are called apocryphal because their obscure origin was unknown to the fathers from whom the authority of the true scriptures has been transmitted to us by a most certain and well ascertained succession. For though there is some truth in these apocryphal writings, yet they contain so many false statements that they have no canonical authority. We cannot deny that Enoch the seventh from Adam left some divine writings, for this is asserted by the Apostle Jude in his canonical epistle. But it is not without reason that these writings have no place in that canon of scripture which was preserved in the temple of the Hebrew people by the diligence of successive priests. For their antiquity brought them under suspicion, and it was impossible to ascertain whether these were his genuine writings, and they were not brought forward as genuine by the persons who were found to have carefully preserved the canonical books by successive transmission. So that the writings which are pro produced under his name and which contain these fables about the giants, saying that their fathers were not men but angels, are properly judged by prudent men to be not genuine, just as many writings are produced by heretics under the names both of other prophets and more recently under the names of the apostles, all of which after careful examination have been set apart from canonical authority under the title of Apocrypha. 
Augustine had decided the issue. After his time, the sons of God in Genesis 6 are no longer angels, but simply the sons of Seth, the daughters of men being the children of Cain, the Cainites. This has since become the standard interpretation of Catholic and Protestant exegetes down to the present day. This is no casual error. This is not something we wink at in the personality or the psychology of Augustine. He devotes a horrendous amount of space to the denial of the record and the very etching in Akasha of his own descent. You begin to realize that the doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church is corrupt to the core. And it has kept a world in bondage and in ignorance for a very insidious reason. Augustine's very inability to believe that holy angels could have so fallen is the same astonishment expressed by those angels when Lucifer fell. They couldn't believe that Lucifer was falling when they watched him fall before their very eyes. And when they fell with him and they were cast down into the earth, which means into the physical plane, as it is revealed in the book of Revelation, they were cast down into the earth. Woe to you inhabitants of earth, those of you who have physicality and are in physical embodiment because the devil is coming down to you having great wrath. He comes down to your estate, to your flesh and blood condition. Beware. And then it says that he went to make war after the seed of the woman who are the seed of Sanat Kumara. When these angels were cast down by pride, they all fell in pride. And their pride was so great, they would not admit that they fell. And they never have admitted that they have fallen. And when you point the finger and accuse them of their fall and their corruption of the word, they denounce you as heretics, just like the disciples of Mani. So they saw him as the great leader. They broke through the barrier, descended. Lucifer became their god as they would learn the hard way. The people who follow his ways today do not know they are falling, that they are following Lucifer. They believe they are following the doctrine of Jesus Christ, which has been warped to conform to his doctrine. Lucifer made himself a god. He made Jesus Christ a god and said to everyone, fall down and worship him, but don't try to become the Christ yourself. And he wrote the doctrine that if you try to become the Christ or declare your inheritance with the sons of God, you blaspheme. There is a warped doctrine on the face of this earth, and this is where it begins, in the very vessels of the renowned church fathers. The non-belief in the fallen state is corrected in one brief paragraph, which is a dictation from El Moria contained in Climb the Highest Mountain. El Moria dictated this paragraph specifically for its publication. It is the definition of soul. He says, the soul is the living potential of God. The soul's demand for free will and its separation from God resulted in the descent of this potential into the lowly estate of the flesh. Sown in dishonor, the soul is destined to be raised in honor to the fullness of that God estate, which is the one spirit of all life. The soul can be lost, but the spirit can never die. 
Therein he confirms that the soul may be lost and may pass through the second death, as it is confirmed for the watchers and the godless, but the spirit of the mighty I Am Presence will never die. In the term, the lowly estate of the flesh, Moria is emphatic that the plane of this octave is a corrupt state of souls who demanded free will, that corruption is inherent in the flesh and blood situation. We understand this. We wear flesh and blood bodies, and we see how easily these bodies are corrupted in sin by the very low-grade vibration at which they are quivering in this physical octave. Now, this very teaching of the corruption of this plane and the corrupt state is one of the teachings of Mani, which makes us wonder, since he taught the religions of East and West, whether or not he might have been someone just like El Moria. Despite the fact that Jesus Christ gave full proof of devil's embodiment in John's Gospel, they still denounced the entire theory. They totally ignored the Gospel of John, which we have been studying this very week. In the long passage in John 8, 31 to 59, some of the key verses concerning this are Jesus' address to these fallen ones, Jesus' denunciation of the Jews. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. You have no word in you. The light is gone out in you. You cannot hear my word. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. Jesus said, my father is my father, your father is your father. We don't have the same father. Where are Jerome and Augustine? Where is Aquinas? Where are they? The Jews answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. They knew Enoch's story. They weren't about to be accused of being the offspring of those fallen angels cohabitating with the daughters of men. No, we're not born of that angel fornication. It's right in the book of John. We have one Father, even God. Jesus said, If God were your Father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech, even because ye cannot hear my word? You don't have any receptor for my word, because ye, of your, ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. Why did he pick that word? Of all the sins the devil has, he picked the word lust, because he confirmed the scripture of Enoch, that it was the lust of the devil, and that is what they do. And then he goes further to define that fallen one of whom they are the offspring. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Now, if the children of the light would study their own scriptures instead of going through the mediators of their priests and rabbis and ministers, they would have the courage of the living word itself to refute this damnable doctrine. Jesus Christ and John the Baptist lived to show us the distinction between the fallen angels and the children of the light. 
They allowed themselves to be crucified, beheaded, so that you and I would know the character of these fallen ones and that they do have flesh and blood bodies. But a Catholic dictionary of theology today calls the story in Enoch that angels could assume bodies wildly improbable. The New Catholic Encyclopedia points out several times that the Book of Enoch is based on a misinterpretation of Genesis 6, 1 to 4. The nature of angels, it declares, is completely spiritual. The logical conclusion of this premise of the incorporeality of angels was noted by Thomas Aquinas long ago, who argued that angels can have no other sin than pride or envy, sins not dependent upon body or sense. In this view, angels simply cannot commit gross sins through bodily passion because their nature is not bodily. The question which the church could never answer was, how on earth could incorporeal angels mate with corporeal daughters of men, rather than admit that the angels must have incarnated in fleshed bodies to perform the task the church preferred to oust the story in Enoch in its entirety? Besides, the fall of the angels could be completely explained by the rebellion of a proud archangel. Well, when you throw away an entire book of scripture that has the power of Enoch, you are making yourself a law unto yourself. You are above God, you are above his messengers, you control the messenger, you say, messenger, you may speak when I tell you, you must be quiet when I tell you. I will take only those things that please me and that are de a defense of my identity, and I will throw out all the rest. This is the sin against the Holy Ghost, and all of these are condemned and judged for it. The inordinate and gross passions of murder and lust on this planet are extreme to the very place where you know that the desire bodies of these people are larger than ordinary people's desire bodies, and that within those astral bodies, they contain those wandering spirits of the giants, those demons. The larger desire body is the sign of the angel, as we said, for good or for ill. They have the power to move people, not only by their desire bodies, but the fact that they are possessed by demons of the very same vibration of their own. Who has not seen the enraged fallen angel charging hither and yon with the power of a superman? We see individuals' anger multiplied ten and twentyfold by the demons that possess them. The warfare against the woman is the rape of her seed in all of the seven chakras. This is what these fallen ones are about. Now the fourth century synod of Laodicea in the years 343 to 381 AD struck another sharp blow against the book of Enoch's angelology. This council two centuries earlier than the one which banned Origen's views on angels as men, decreed that the only angels which may be named were Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael, who are the only angels mentioned in the church's scriptures. The council also prohibited by a canon that prayer should be offered to angels on the grounds that it was a species of idolatry and detracted from the worship due to Christ. You recognize it is a fundamental tenet of the monotheism of the Great White Brotherhood that we worship one God and we give reverence to all of his servants. We regard them as holy and blessed. We bow before the light in an ascended master or an archangel, and we know that the light God has placed in our bodies is God himself. So through the individual, we worship one God. We do not worship ascended masters, archangels, or Elohim. We regard them as cohorts of light. And therefore, you see, this 
particular denunciation deprives the children of the light of those appointed by God to defend them in their battles against the fallen angels. Why to call to Archangel Michael is to enlist his aid in the binding of the fallen ones, and so to deny the call to these angels is to strip the children of the light of their guardians. A commentary notes that the Synod held its meeting at Laodicea in Phrygia because the people there believed angels to be defenders of the law and were therefore supposedly worshiping them. The commentary also notes that Pope Zachary in 745 AD held a Roman council against one Adalbert who was found to invoke by name eight angels in his prayers. <laughs> How then would the intricate angelology in the Book of Enoch, which names far more than three angels, ever survive? Now the condemnation of this false pope is not only on Adalbert, but on every one of you who invokes eight or more angels or sons of God ascended masters in your prayers. That condemnation is a thought form that yet emanates from the Roman Catholic Church. And in order to defend itself against such as you and me, they must accuse us of being a cult, a dangerous cult. They are afraid because they know the power of the sons of God. The whole story of Enoch is coming home, embodied in our hearts, and they're getting uneasy in their seats. Rabbi Simeon ben Jokai in the second century AD spoke ever more strongly than the church fathers did when he pronounced a curse on those who said the sons of God in Genesis 6 2 to be angels, although that had been the age old Jewish interpretation of the verse. The rabbi's curse was apparently effective because from the second century onwards, sparse mention is made in Jewish literature to the original book of Enoch. Who curses the faithful? Black magicians curse the faithful, not the priests of the order of Melchizedek. After all, if there were a false teaching among us, would I not expose it in love and explain to you that this is not something to be espoused? Would I stand at the altar and curse you for believing it? Is this the work of the sons of God? You see, the anathema is taken for granted, as though the authorities of the church have the right to curse their people. It must have been knowledge of the rabbi's curse which prompted Origen's remark a century later that the Book of Enoch was not accepted among the Jews. And it may have been the work of earlier rabbis that first began to hide the book away into the shadows of Judaic tradition so that, as Augustine noted, it was not found among the approved scriptures of the Jews. This doesn't show you the power of one rabbi. It shows you the power of one curse because curses are always reinforced by the fallen ones. The devil reinforces the curse. What eventually happened to the book? In a recent study of the Apocrypha, writer Nicholas DeLange cites a revealing passage in some texts of the Talmud found in the context of Rabbi Akiba's statement that whoever reads the excluded books has no share in the world to come, whatever world he might be referring to. <laughs> Following this, the Babylonian teacher, Rab Joseph, is usually quoted as saying, it is forbidden to read the book of Ben Sira, another ap apocryphal work, but we may teach the good things it contains. Other texts, however, in place of this last sentence read, if the rabbis had not hidden this book away, we should be able to teach the good things it contains. DeLang notes that the expression hiding away denotes the process applied to sacred texts and other sacred objects which were no longer considered fit for use. According to the Talmud, he continues, the sages had even considered hiding away the book of Ezekiel, 
on account of the supposedly misleading teachings it contained. Fortunately for us, some of the best, some of the best books slipped through. Also central to the question of Enoch's disappearance from religious scriptures is the fact that books were generally produced in small quantities in this era before the invention of the printing press. In order for a book to survive, it would need to be continually recopied by scribes. The easiest way to suppress a text was to simply not have it copied. Once a book fell into disapproval with the authorities, the scribes were hardly likely to copy it. The book then was allowed to fade into obscurity. So Christians and Jews alike denounced and suppressed the story in Enoch of the fall of angels through the lusts of the flesh. You need to understand that this is a broad lust. It's not just a sexual lust. It's a lust after the light. They were cut off from God. And therefore, they had to get the light from all of the chakras of the mother's children. Beginning at the base, which is the fount of white fire, and going through all of the seven planes of being, they have raped every plane of consciousness, stolen the light of, of, of the chakras in all of the devious methods, whether of drugs or rock or television or media or sugar or things affecting the physical body, the mental, the emotional, or the etheric. Genetic engineering causes people to have their chakras and cells vulnerable so that their light can easily be taken. The list goes on and on and on of what this term lust means. It means they want your light, all of it, the light in every cell of your body, and they're going to get it one way or another, beginning with the actual rape, the physical rape of the women, and therefore causing the women to carry their seed and produce those giants. The verdicts of heresy and blasphemy rested against Enoch for over 1,500 years. That means every subsequent incarnation of origin bore the cursings of the entire Roman hierarchy. And those cursings are amplified as they hold captive the saints to their masses and to their repetitions of the spoken word. 1,500 years, a single man bears the curse of the fallen angels, and our souls breathe a sigh of relief that he is ascended and untouchable today. Until, until, the 20th century discovery of several Aramaic manuscripts of the Book of Enoch among the Dead Sea Scrolls prompted scholar J.T. Millick to compile a complete history of the Enoch legends, including translations of the Aramaic manuscripts. Millick's 400-page book, published in 1976 by Oxford, is a milestone in Enochian scholarship, and Millick himself is no doubt one of the world's finest experts on the subject. His opinions, based as they are on years of in-depth research, are highly respected. Millick notes the obviously close interdependence of the story of the fallen angels in Enoch, chapter 6, 19, and the story of the sons of God in Genesis 6. But he does not draw the conclusion drawn by the church fathers, namely that the book of Enoch misinterpreted the earlier Genesis tale. Millick rather arrives at a surprising yet well-justified conclusion that not only is the fallen angel story in Enoch older than Genesis 6, but Genesis 6 is in fact a direct summary of the earlier Enoch manuscript. This is what Millick calls the ineluctable solution. It is Genesis 6 that is based on Enoch and not the other way around. 
Millick thinks that the text of Genesis 6, by its abridged and elusive formulation and direct quoting of two or three phrases of Enoch, must be the later of the two, making the Enoch legend earlier than the definitive chapters in Genesis. Millick has thus quietly but deftly turned the tables on the late church fathers who banned the Enoch story of fallen angels mating with daughters of men, who labeled Enoch's teaching a heretical misinterpretation of Genesis 6. For if Genesis 6 was really based on the book of Enoch, then obviously Genesis 6 is telling the same story as Enoch, the story of fallen angels lusting after the daughters of men. If Millick is right and the evidence leans in his favor, then the criteria upon which the fathers based their judgments against the book of Enoch are fully invalidated, and their testimony against Enoch is refuted. Their arguments have no ground. Enoch's case must be reopened and retried, and so must Origen's. But the astute reader will ask, if Genesis 6 tells of the fall of the angels through lust, what about the other biblical fall of the archangel through pride, as told in Isaiah and as noted by the later church fathers long ago? Here again, 20th century scholarship provides an answer that was unavailable in the patristic era. In 1939, an article was published by Hebrew Union College. Julian Morgenstern presented his theories on the mythological background of Psalm 82. Nearly a hundred pages of research which led him directly into the controversy surrounding Genesis 6, verses 1 to 4. In his unparalleled and detailed probing into the specific meaning of the passage, Morgenstern discovered that tied up in the Genesis verse are traces of two distinct and originally entirely unrelated myths dealing with gods or angels. In his brilliant exegesis, Morgan Stern proves that originally two stories of separate falls of the angels were known. One, that of the archangel's rebellion against the authority of God and his fall through pride, along with those angels who followed him in the rebellion, biblically called the Nephilim. And two, the other story recorded faithfully in the book of Enoch, the later fall of the angels called watchers through inordinate lust for the daughters of men. Morgan Stern explains that the very construction of Genesis 6-4, one of the most intricate and obscure Old Testament verses, implies that it is referencing two stories simultaneously. The verse reads in literal English, the Nephilim were on the earth at that time and even afterward when the sons of God resorted to the daughters of man and had children by them. The text specifically sets side by side two facts. One, there used to be beings called Nephilim, which literally means fallen ones on earth. And two, they were around when the sons of God came down and mated with the daughters of men. Clearly, says Morgenstern, the Nephilim are fallen angels who were already on the earth when the sons of God, the other angels which Enoch depicted, also fell to their own lust. But how did the Nephilim fallen angels get here to earth in the first place? That, states Morgenstern, is where the story of the rebellious archangel and the fall through pride fits in. That is the earlier of two entirely separate celestial events. Now, as we look at this, we realize the teaching of the great divine director comes home. The Nephilim arrived first, and what did they do? They brought their laggards, their scientists, they created mechanization man. Mechanization man. What do we have then? We have actually that these daughters of men that were on earth 
were of the men. They were not offsprings of the sons of man, the manifestation of the Son of God. The daughters of men were mechanization man, the creation of the Nephilim, and other angels decided to come down and make playthings of them. This is why there were giants born to them, because they were half Nephilim and half Homo erectus. So they had an evil spirit in them. They were of the seed of Cain, who was one of those fallen angels. And when the next group cohabited with them, they produced giants and evil spirits. What seems to have caused scriptural confusion in later times is the many-faceted meaning of the word Nephilim. The synopsis in Genesis 6 is so terse and abbreviated that it apparently became all but unreadable to later Jews. Some seem to have thought the Nephilim were the same as the sons of God in that verse, while others thought the Nephilim were the evil children of the sons of God and the daughters of men. The latter misunderstanding cropped up in the Book of Jubilees and in some editions of the Enoch material. On top of this confusion, the Greek Septuagint, a late translation of the Hebrew Scriptures, rendered the word Nephilim as giants, eliminating all connotations of fallen angels. The evil giant children born to the fallen angels and daughters of men were known to the Hebrews specifically as Giborim or Giborim, literally heroes or mighty men. Now these Giborim have the vibration of being a created race, a laboratory race, a race not created out of the will of our Father. But later editors in the confusion mixed up the Nephilim with these Giborim and also with the giants of Numbers, chapter 13, verse 33, the Anakim, the Anakim, which means the offspring of Anak. Morgenstern notes that the term Nephilim is in the passive voice, i.e., those who were made to fall are those who were cast down, rather than in the active voice, Nophilim, those who fell of their own accord or in a natural manner, as in Ezekiel. You can see in chapter 12 of the book of, Re of Revelation that certain of the angels who wrestled against Archangel Michael were cast out of heaven by Archangel and his legions. Archangel Michael and his legions cast out that fallen one and his angels. They did not want to be cast down. They wanted to have their rebellion, and they wanted to remain in heaven. It took a battle, a heavenly battle, a galactic Armageddon for Archangel Michael to force these fallen ones into physical embodiment, fulfilling the law that everyone must be evolving at the state of his consciousness. Wherever the tree falls, it must lie. To whatever lowly estate consciousness descends, that is where it must embody. This explains the gradations of hierarchies which Origen gave to us. He shows us that the degrees of angels and their holiness and their offices depends on the type of descent of consciousness. We find that in the judgment of the fallen ones, they do not want to be cast out or cast down. They want to enjoy the privileges of the sons of God who have not fallen. They want to remain in high places, though they themselves are now of the lowly estate. So the term Nephilim, according to Morgenstern, which would denote those who were made to fall, as opposed to Nephilim or Nophilim, who fell of their own accord or in a natural manner. It is possible, however, that in time this specific meaning of the term Nephilim became more generalized and applied to whoever or whatever was wicked, especially in the concept that through the ages the whole fallen ones intermarrying with their kind and with the godless became a melting pot of their own. 
and this all, thus all came to be known under one label. Thus the giant Gibberim, born to the lustful angels and women, might have been labeled Nephilim, namely fallen ones, simply because they were of fallen character like the original Nephilim, who already walked the earth and seemed like giants in their own right. With so many definitions and misunderstandings piled on top of the word, it is not surprising that the story of the original Nephilim who fell with the archangel through pride got lost in the translation. But if Morgan Stern is right, he throws strike two to the church fathers and rabbis who banned the book of Enoch. The seeming contradiction between two falls of angels eventually used by the fathers against Enoch disappears if there are separate stories of two falls. Enoch's book, then, is a trustworthy preservation of the one fall, the one through lust, that would otherwise have been lost to posterity but for a few other brief apocryphal references. The Church Father's denial of Enoch's tale thus clouded man's understanding of the fallen angels for centuries. The clouding of that understanding became the clouding of his understanding of his own salvation, which necessitated in its very process the judgment of the fallen one and the incarnation of the Christ. Furthermore, the statements of the later church fathers against the idea of physical incarnations of angels are far from authoritative. Linguistic proof supports the theory that the Jews of ancient times believed the fallen angels physically incarnated in flesh bodies. In an early but respected study in the late 19th century, Franz de Litsch shows that the wife choosing of the fallen angels was a contract of actual and lasting marriages, as shown by the Hebrew verb used to describe them. To make this to a certain degree conceivable, says Delitch, we must admit an assumption of human bodies by angels, and hence not merely transitory appearances of angels in human form, but actual angelic incarnation. Morgan Stern also speculates that for the early Jews, the fallen angels were quite physical, noting that the crime of the sons of God was one which was characteristic of the human level of existence. He shows that God's punishment of these angels was that they take on the nature and quality of the human women with whom they had associated themselves carnally, and that they became and that they become mortal. Morgan Stern says, no other conclusion is possible. One by one, the arguments against the Book of Enoch fade away. The day may soon arrive when the final complaints about Enoch's lack of historicity and late date also are silenced by new evidence of the book's real antiquity. There is also a more metaphysical explanation of how the Book of Enoch may be of late date, yet still carry the words of the ancient father Enoch. Tertullian proposed that the book could have been reproduced after the flood through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Likewise did Ezra, according to Jewish legend, reproduce under God's dictation the text of all the scriptures destroyed when the Torah was burned. An unknown prophet inspired by the Holy Spirit might have also restored this ancient book of Enoch to a later era which had lost the original. Not only could the book be authentically the ancient story of the real Enoch, it could also be the answer to the philosopher's conundrum of the origin of evil in God's universe. And recall that Enoch foresaw the final judgment of the fallen angels in a generation which is to succeed at a distant period on account of the elect. If the distant generation he referenced was in fact this 20th century, heralded by, heralded by many as a time of judgment, then this volume of Enoch's teachings on the judgment of the fallen angels and the coming kingdom of the Ancient of Days may make a most timely appearance.
this lecture which I have given you is written by way of being an introduction to our own republishing of the Book of Enoch. Rather than ask the reader of Enoch 1 and 2, which will be in this volume, to accept my personal witness as to the incarnation of the fallen angels, this particular approach will be convincing in its entirety without any interjections concerning the reading the probing of the aura which we have done and which God has shown us. I'm sure you would have been equally interested to hear me discourse this evening on life readings that I have done on many individuals in embodiment who have been the betrayers of the word. But you see, then I would have been, so to speak, preaching to the choir, <laughs> giving you what you already believe. But now you have a statement that gives you the authority of all of this to run with, to study, to know, to understand, and therefore to awaken the people profoundly and fundamentally in an ancient tradition which is theirs by right, by inheritance. And aside from these pa papers published by Morgenstern or Millick, there is not a popular format for the people themselves to get involved in this study. Now, perhaps in moments this evening you have been burdened by long readings or interpretations. But this somehow is the need of our brothers and sisters who have been taught to rely upon the mental body for the proof of all things. Therefore, since there is proof, and it does exist, and it can be researched, we have scratched, we have dug, we have gone to books that libraries would not let out, we have gone to old manuscripts and quotes of origin that you do not find quoted elsewhere, and assembled, really, a relatively simple statement, made our thesis, it stands on its own two feet and therefore opens another door to the self-awareness of those who need another gate to the temple. There are 12 gates to the holy city, one gate that is just right for everyone. It is our desire to write in the traditions of the masters and the angels who keep the flame of these gates to provide each of the masters of our cosmic clock with those books that enable them to go after their chilas, their disciples, and most of all, their unascended twin flames. I trust then that as we work together over the years from many angles that the statement of truth will be like the many jewels of light that adorn the doors of the holy city and the breastplate of Aaron of Melchizedek, and that by and by no one will feel left out of that place of divine consciousness because there will be a door by which he can enter. Perhaps you may remember the time when you had no door, when there was no means to get from the place you were in consciousness to the place of your Christ self, because no one had formed the bridge. Each ascended master has his teaching, and for someone that teaching and that teaching alone is the bridge. And until they get that teaching, they cannot come through one of the gates. Now once they get through one of the gates, they're in, right? 
So now they have access to all of the teaching of all of the gates because we know all roads lead to the central sun. The fallen ones would like to have all roads lead to Rome. But in this age, we're bombing the bridges. 